Good morning, everyone. So happy to have you with us this morning, Larry. Before we begin our discussion, which I'm really looking forward to, I have a couple of housekeeping items for you all. We're gonna be doing questions a little differently today to get everyone more involved in the conversation. When we get to questions, if you'd like to ask a question directly, please just raise your hand. If you would rather um, remain anonymous, you can email questions, and this is really simple, to q at nytimes.com. We will put this on the screen, but it's q at nytimes.com, and Adam will ask the question on your behalf. And please remember to keep them as short as possible so we can get as many in as possible. Larry, you have been Treasury Secretary. You helped the nation out of a recession. You have been president of Harvard. You ended your presidency at Harvard in a rather dramatic fashion, I must say. Would you please uh, give your reflections a decade later? You know, uh, seems, like a long, seems like a long time ago. You know, if I look back, I made plenty of mistakes. I created more turbulence than I should have. I set more priorities than I should have, and that generated much more controversy, and it caused my tenure to be shorter than I would have hoped or than those who appointed me uh, would, have, uh, would have hoped. And you know, those are real mistakes, and they're on me. On the other hand, I have to say I look back with a lot of pride on uh, those years. I came with the view that a great institution had become rather complacent and decadent and was failing to meet its responsibilities uh, to uh, the world and with a lot of determination to fix that. And I think there's a lot from those years that I can look back on and that I hope Harvard can look back on with a lot of pride. We put in place uh, a program that now many others have emulated that meant that no one with an income under, family income under $60,000 had to pay anything at all to go to Harvard. And that did a lot to put the issue of equal opportunity and economic diversity on the map in higher education. We put a focus that frankly hadn't been there for a long time on teaching uh, in the classroom. And, did something that probably should have been there for a long time before, made sure that every student at Harvard had access to several seminars during their four years at uh, Harvard, that uh, Harvard moved away from a tradition where it had less study abroad than any institution in the country, uh, except for West Point and Annapolis, um, before uh, we got there. We took on... Uh, questions of management in universities. Um, when, we got, when I got there, um, people thought it was academic freedom to be able to buy a Dell or an IBM computer. And as a consequence, the scale of Harvard's purchasing power wasn't used to buy cheaper uh, computers. And more consequentially, Harvard had more professors over 80 than it did under 40. And uh, that was an important issue uh, for us uh, to take on. I thought a central thing that Harvard needed to do, and I think, we're, I think this has moved along in a, in a very, very good way, was uh, to basically make sure that when the next Silicon Valley was built around the life sciences, it took place in the Boston area. And that meant Harvard and its teaching hospitals. That meant taking a different approach to private sector collaboration than most Ivy League universities uh, had before. And I also stood for, and I didn't always do it in the right ways, but I stood for the principle that uh, in many ways the most important kind of diversity for an academic institution was diversity of ideas and thought, and that there needed to not be an orthodoxy. Number of people mad on our campus, but I would do it again by being the first Ivy League president in 30 years, in 30 years, 
to attend an ROTC commissioning ceremony. And I thought that given all that universities benefit from their association with the United States, that citizenship came with responsibility as well as privilege. And that meant being part of, uh, it meant supporting uh, the military. And on a range of other issues, I thought it was very, very important that uh, all viewpoints um, be uh, represented. And I think there's been some cultural change, at least at Harvard, not enough from my point of view, on, uh, on those things. Do you so think that I'm proud of the change that got brought about. I, I wish it could have been brought about with uh, less uh, turbulence. But I, I guess I do think that complacency, uh, orthodoxy, um, around a certain set of ideas and uh, focus inwards is, are besetting problems uh, facing higher education. And Harvard's a kind of city on a hill in higher education, at least a lot of people want to watch. And I was very determined to change all that. I wish I'd done it in shrewder ways, but uh, I basically am proud of the side that I was on in most of the arguments. Many of the controversies on campuses these days seem to be rather insular, sometimes over food, uh, liberating supper clubs, speakers. Uh, you just mentioned that colleges are turning inward. Are, are they missing an opportunity during these times by focusing too much on these yeah, I think it's. I think it's a tragedy. I mean, look, we've got a president of the United States who denies science on global climate change. We've got a budget of the United States that literally contains uh, arithmetic uh, errors uh, in them. We've got the concept of alternative facts treated as like a serious mode of discourse. And that's the moment when what universities are supposed to stand for is most important and most needed to be infused into the society. And what are they talking about instead? That nobody's offering training in rigorous analysis. But you know, the University of California, which is the largest university system uh, we have, uh, sent a memo to all of its faculty urging them that they attend seminars to understand microaggressions, where they would be taught that saying that America was a land of opportunity was a microaggression, where they would be taught that the use of the term meritocracy was highly problematic, where they would be taught that saying you can get what you want if you're prepared to work hard was stigmatizing of those who had not been, uh, uh, those who had not been uh, successful. Um, prejudice as anyone, and I've, I've spent the money and led the charge on e equal uh, economic uh, opportunity, and it's pretty clear from how I've spent my life which side of the political aisle uh, that, that I'm on. But it seems to me that universities need uh, to be obsessed with truth, with discovering ever closer approximations to truth, with insisting on clearer and more transparent debates in which every point of view can, uh, can be achieved. I mean, this was brought home to me, and you know, different people will have uh, different, uh, different views. Uh, it was brought home to me years ago. I was privileged, at not because of me, but because of the title I held as president of Harvard, to receive an honorary degree at a, another major university. And the president gave the commencement speech. It was, very, it was really a very good speech. And at, once, and at one point, the speech said, you know, here at our university, we debate every question. We look at every kind of data. We study every kind of text. We examine every uh, argument. We engage in the most intense dialogue. And out of that comes, and I was waiting for you know, some phrase like, 
a closer approximation to the perfect truth we will never find. Mm -hmm. And instead, what I heard was a greater appreciation and a respect for each other's point of view. And I think that's exactly the opposite of what a university should stand for. A university should stand for open and real debate, but it should not stand in respectful debate and a willingness to listen. But that does not mean that the perspective that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is the same as the perspective that 2 plus 2 equals 5. That does not mean that the perspective that uh, carbon is heating up the planet is the same as the perspective of carbon is not heating up uh, the, the planet. That, that does not mean that all understandings of Islamic culture are, uh, equally, uh, are equally valid. And so I think we have, in important respects, lost our way into a kind of mushy relativism where all ideas are equally good and everybody's ideas have to be, uh, res have to be respected. And I think in an odd way, it licenses some of the most disturbing uh, trends uh, in, our, uh, in our national life. So it's something that, something at least uh, very much concerns me, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. What are university presidents to do over this free speech issue? It is affected Middlebury, Berkeley, commencement addresses are, are, are viewed with great sensitivity these days. What, what are, look, what I are don't presidents think really supposed look, to do? Look, I think President Zimmer at the University of Chicago uh, got it about right. There's a safe space, a safe space with respect to hearing ideas you don't like. It's your parents' house. It is not any place on a uh, college uh, campus. Uh, it should not be demands that speakers be disinvited, should be rejected. The obligation to um, maintain order and give every, every speaker a chance to be heard, should be uh, respected. And when those norms of civility are violated, there should be consequences for those who violate them. One of the first things I did when I became uh, president of Harvard was I had the corporation and the overseers, the, basically, the basically the trustees, reaffirm an amended policy that made absolutely clear that if you were in a building after you were asked to leave, mm. and after you were asked to leave through you know, a number of steps, you would be suspended or expelled from school. And that, just before I came, 30 students had kept the president and the other senior administrators out of the office for 15 days occupying it. And there had been zero discipline. I made clear that wouldn't happen while I was president. And nobody occupied any buildings uh, during uh, that time. And I think it was the right thing to do. The test at Middlebury, which is a particularly egregious incident because not only was a speaker shouted down, but a faculty member was injured. Yeah. The test is not, whether, is not what the rhetoric is about we condemn this and it's against Middlebury's values. The test is going to be whether there are going to be some students who are identified and who are punished. And the record on students who shout down speakers who engage in violent uh, acts, who occupy buildings after they're being asked to do, uh, asked uh, to leave, is not very encouraging uh, to date. You know, at, at one major Ivy League university uh, a couple of years ago, there was actually a negotiation with students 
over what the university was going to do on a set of concerns while the students were in the president's office. I mean, if, if these behaviors are rewarded, they will be perpetuated. Now, that does not mean, and uh, this is a very important distinction, I think, academic freedom does not include freedom from criticism. And so to say that people should not be disinvited is not to say that what they say can't be attacked or even mocked. And certain kinds of invitations are unwise. The bestowal of honors on people who perhaps don't deserve them is unwise. And if one part of a university community or even a senior university administrator wants to declare that, in their view, that some decision to bestow an honor was inappropriate or wrong, that is part of uh, dialogue. You know, I expressed, I expressed the view that uh, while I was um, uh, president, that those who were calling for an uh, academic boycott of Israel were um, anti-Semitic, that, that if they got their way, and there actually was a boycott of Israel, that would be anti-Semitic in effect, if not intent, making the argument that if you singled out Israel when there were a number of other countries who were guilty of the same sins, that certainly at that time, um, it raised a question. And that I cited the State Department's definition of anti-Semitism as I did that. Many people felt that I was somehow infringing on free speech. But I felt I wasn't infringing on free speech. I was freely speaking. <laughs> and uh, that uh, I wasn't saying anybody couldn't say whatever they wanted to say. They could call on the university to do whatever they wanted. But I felt that it was appropriate uh, to be in a position of responding. So I, I guess I subscribe to the general doctrine in this area that the answer to bad speech uh, is more speech. And, and to, well, let me say one other thing, because okay. I, I do feel strongly <laughs> about this. The, you know, there was a survey at UCLA that said that 60% of entering college freshmen think that it should be permissible to ban speakers if what they're going to say is thought to be racist or sexist. I think that's very dangerous. I think it's very, very dangerous. And I, but I think it's understandable when we look for microaggressions and encourage people to point up microaggressions and venerate comfort as a value. I would say if your liberal arts education does not cause you several moments of acute discomfort and doubt about your prior convictions, that education's been a failure. Before we go to questions, I want to ask you about the cost of college. Uh, it's such a big topic these days. It feels to me that, that you have emphasize economic diversity as much as, as other kinds of diversity. Are colleges approaching diversity in the wrong manner in terms of financial aid and, and looking at uh, getting the, a good mix of students to their student body? I think there's three parts to that. Uh, one- and We only have a couple minutes. Yeah, I'll be very quick. <laughs> one, they've, one, they've gotta be, one, they've gotta be run better. They're not run efficiently. You know, there were people at Harvard who thought that getting to choose the kind of concrete they wanted themselves was a kind of academic freedom. And you just got to run the business functions in a serious way to contain, uh, contain costs. Two, uh, the right kinds of financial aid policies are absolutely essential. And we just need more, better targeted public money in this area. I mean, it's easy for me to be a little bit of a hero posturing on this at Harvard with an endowment of its size. Most institutions can't afford to do that, and so they depend on uh, government. And we need more public resources for higher education so financing. You the, the yeah, free, more free PAL, more yeah. PAL, more of what Andrew Cuomo is trying to do in New York. And the third thing is, 
and the, lots of parts of the higher education community don't like this, um, we need accountability and measures of outcome for both for-profit and not-for-profit institutions. There are real scandals in what's happened in the for-profit world. But the idea that you should see whether people actually graduate, that you should see whether people who are borrowing $50,000 on a federal government guarantee actually are, get jobs after this training for which they can, uh, which give them the wherewithal to repay those loans. That's not an idea that should just be applied to for-profit higher education. That's an idea that um, should be uh, applied much more broadly. So you, know, you, don't you don't judge the value of a life by how much someone earns, but at the same time, you do have to find ways of having some accountability that something of value is, uh, is being uh, provided. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Adam, you want to get us started with questions? Yes, I know this isn't a shy crowd, so we'd love to get some questions. Please raise your hand. I know this isn't a shy crowd. <laughs> I've got a ton. If, uh... Okay. <laughs> we do have an anonymous question from the audience. Um, the top three things you would tell any new president taking her or his post today based on your experience. Top three pieces of advice. Within six months, you should know how your institution, how you want your institution to be different five years later than it was when you came. And if you don't know the answer to that question, you're marking time, not, uh, provi not providing uh, leadership, um, one. Two, uh, that I did understand. Two, understand that in your world, you, because you're president, have a megaphone, and therefore there's no need for you to shout. That's something I did not understand, <laughs> and got me into uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, trouble. And three, um, make sure uh, you spend time cultivating all your key constituencies. Uh, faculty uh, and uh, trustees and building goodwill and if everything's a priority nothing's a priority and so decide what the five most important three most important whatever it is yep. things that you want to do are okay that's great is there a hand over down in front one. please and please uh, wait for the microphone and then please state your name and... Okay, uh, I'm David Burroughs. I'm from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, my question has to do with change. Uh, you mentioned that well-established institutions or programs can become complacent. How do you make them change without totally tearing them apart? So look, uh, I'm a, I, I, think a fair, I think a fair reading of my time is that I achieved quite a lot of change on quite a number of dimensions with quite a lot of tearing apart. And so I'm not sure that I'm the right person to tell you, uh, to tell you the answer. It's easy to achieve change and it's easy to achieve not tearing apart and it's not so easy to achieve both of them uh, together. But I guess the points I'd emphasize are one, uh, figure out the change that's most important, not all the possible change uh, that would be good. Two, and in retrospect, I, under, I understood this, but I didn't understand it well enough. Um, it's easier to start a new thing than to change an old thing. And so when you want something new to happen, start something that, uh, does the new thing, channel new resources to it, raise funds for it, and let the other things kind of go about their way and shrink a little and let the focus turn uh, to uh, the new things. And I, I've watched over time, both in university life and in corporate life, that many of the shrewder managers worry less about a tidy organization chart 
but they basically do set up things that are redundant. When they have something that's not good, they set up redundancy and let a new, better version of it gradually crowd out the existing version rather than taking on change directly, and that can sometimes be the right strategy. Back to you, Rebecca. Great. Well, uh, this is going to be a big day in the news. Do you have any quick uh, uh, insights or, or con particular concerns about Trump's economic policies just before we leave the stage? Comments about Paris or... Uh, you've given me... Um, <laughs> you've, got 12, you've got 12 seconds for a 1,000 observations. Um, <laughs> Very difficult for you, I know. Look, uh, <laughs> I heard a great phrase the other day. Malevolence limited primarily by incompetence <laughs> as a description of the economic uh, policies. They are uh, hard-hearted, backward-looking, violative of the laws of arithmetic, and deeply threatening to our relations uh, with uh, other countries. Now, I think the best, I think the thing though that should be said is that this is an incredibly resilient country. And I think Winston Churchill captured one of the deepest truths about the United States when he said that the United States always, always does the right thing, but only after exhausting the alternatives. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great discussion.